있습니다. 땡큐. 리얼가나이즈 미디어 포토니 투터. 
which I think is legit, but you can say well, what sort of matter, right? But if you find a solution with matter, that's that's the answer to your equation. That sort of matter is giving you dot that that the sitter or that the for that. But I realize that okay, if you want to be let's say more formal, you would say, okay, what's even the definition of spin when you have a reference metric which is the sitter is not even cost? We are sort of being open minded when we do that. Alright, so you can also do an image matrix if you want, in fact this has been done. And I will just say <coughs> this is not updated, or maybe it is, but I, I certainly not everyone who should be in that slide is. The other way is around is you really, really, really like it for W, and so you go after other solution, maybe open universe solution, you can make the reference method the sitter, which doesn't work as we will see. You can put the Stuckerberg's order <coughs> the coefficients of the interactions of massive gravity, that seems to work so far, but moralysis needs to be done. Or we can make the reference metric dynamical, and a lot of work has been done. Right? The other possibility, of course, to completely modify at least a degree of freedom count, or even more than that, and you get a lot of other effects, and a lot of other dynamics, which is worth exploring. So all this slide is there to tell that what we're doing is not the only, the only thing that you can do. And these are all worthy endeavors, right? Now, for the, uh, I talked to you about the Gucci. I told you that that was that was going to be a problem. Let's see why this is going to be a problem. We have this stability requirement in massive gravity, the reference metric, which is allowed to be considered in the point of view. The stability condition is this one. The other condition I mentioned before in that Victorian way is this one. You can try and combine them. You get something like this. And the only way for it to be satisfied is for you to play with alpha three and alpha four, this three coefficient. You try, you play with them, you realize this is not possible. Alpha three minus one four, 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 putting alpha zero, <coughs> all other stuff, it doesn't work. So we hope to get a for that solution in <coughs> even by playing with the reference metric, this shouldn't be there. In fact, as a you know, as a as another step, if you really like the front up, what you can do is do like that. I look for a FRW solution there. <coughs> what I want to say now, which might not be important for this slide, but let's say for later, is if you don't put any matter in this theory, this immediate, of course, this identification G and F are really on the same grounds. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that actually, if you want to exchange G and F in this theory, you can do it immediately. The only identification you need to be aware of is this one. And this will turn out to be useful later because well, this is in front of what we can think of a Galileum and we're relating a Galileum with a Vala Galileum, so that, that's sort of correct. So without telling you how to do it, because this has been uh, done many times already, I'll tell you what the stability bound for a uh, black is. So it looks like this. And the only, so I've been checked in many, many different ways, so I'll say it can be possible. Looks like this, <coughs> the important bit is just this bit. This is the same breast mass which we had in massive gravity, so no news there, and the news is here. And that is telling you there's a region in the parameter space, this one, HF over M, and that's much, much larger than H or MP, and you can start that and stay there in the dynamics, which is in the chat, where you have the usual one, the usual tension on M squared from coming from the Friedman equation, but if you require this to be true, you don't need to take M to the left and take M to the right if you want the stability bound to be satisfied in the Freeman equation to be fine. You can actually play this game. In fact, we have played this game. We plug in all the numbers into the equation of motion and notice here that we are not putting matter on the F side for this specific example. You, you might want to check it with matter, but this specific example is just with matter on the F sector. We have tried this, you plug in numbers, the stability bound is satisfied. The unitary disability bound is satisfied, I should say, to be more precise. Can you remove that thing from the other? Oh, I'm just press the cross bar. Sorry. What, what should I press? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I think it's automatically after you put it on the slide for. Yeah. Again, turn up, let me when I was going to tell you over. So, actually, you can try and plug in some numbers to see if, for example, you can get some self-accelerated solution in this case. And if you keep beta 2 and beta 3 and 0 and beta 1 active, you will free that you got a stable self-accelerated solution. This is telling you that you did. 
then you go look at the SRs and Trends paper, you see that these actually are being compared to lambda CDM, CDM and you, you look at the p-value, and extremely, extremely happy. Stability bound again for this specific model is satisfied, so your happiness can only increase. But at some point though, you have to realize the fact that we checked this one, which was the disastrous first week that you checked in that theory, but the gradient instability should have been checked, and in fact, it was not that it should have been checked, but what these guys did here, so that they check it. There's this group, and also this group, who show that there is a problem, there is a gradient instability, and so what, there's been discussion already in this conference how to go around it, and actually I think uh, Adam and Yosha were talking about this during their uh, back presentation, so maybe if you consider the production, play with the device, so you can get around this problem, but for the purpose of this slide, let's say that this is a problem, let's deal with it first. So we have this problem, we might find a way around it, this is the situation. Now from here, I want to go to another, well, staying within this, probing the effective mass in different circumstances, looking at different quantities, what I want to talk about is actually gravitational waves. And as an inspiration for looking at this, I, I, will, I will actually want to consider this, this model, which in a, in a sort of assumed regime of the theory, is actually seems to be safe from gradient instability because the gradient instability is outside the, the reach of the effective theory. But what I'm going to say, you know, it's true just as much. It's just that I like that model and it, it provides us with some... Sorry, could, could you remind us at least me? I mean, what are the features of the model? I mean, yes. With, with, so this is a probability model yeah. in which the uh, the mass, the bare mass, is extremely okay. high. Do you remember that? It, okay. The mass, there's a tuning condition on the bare mass of the gravity, which makes the gravity stability live outside the range of the effect. Okay. It's a tuned model, but it works in the sense that pushes away the gravity stability. And for the purpose of what I'm going to say, is simply work. All right. So what I'm going to do is review a little bit this work by, done by the Boskin collaborators in 2010. So there was no Boss free at the time, except in your Lawrence Bank theory, but everything that they said was actually very nice because all you need to know is this one. This is the equation of motion for the amplitude of tensors at recombination. So at recombination. At recombination, just say it again. So if you have a theory of mass gravity which is viable, all the way up to the combination, what you do is take the tensor equation of motion, look at the mass, that's not going to be M, it's going to be an effective, <coughs> everything I'm going to say just goes <coughs> on. Because what they did was a purely phenological analysis, they just said, give me this and I give you all the results. Probably no. you, you need more than that, right? Because there are extra degrees of freedom. So, okay, this is the for, for, for scalar mode, but for instance, for the CMD, yes. the length is important. So probably vectors will be relevant for, for the length, I guess. I'm not really an expert. They claim that they are not, but I I, not being an expert myself, I cannot put my hands in. I see. So they claim that even vector could be relevant, they're not. Let me put it maybe more precise. I think they claim that some of the effects that they're going to show, which you could actually enhance with the mass, the, the gravitational wave signal, those will be their angles. And another thing I should say, this is zero, but it should be zero with an asterisk, because you have to take care of neutrinos, of course, etc. But again, what they what they say is that this should be true. Even actually, they they don't say this should be true even if I can't find neutrinos. So further, they have to put them in in current like calculation. So that that's actually completely taken into account. But I'm simply fine when I put a zero. All right. So the point is that you have this d, the amplitude of the tensor noise. What you do is you plug in this horrible formula. It is not horrible because it's written in a proper way. It is horrible. But the, the point is that D will feed immediately the source, this, this psi. So psi is proportional to D squared, which will give you, after you evolve this stuff, which will give you basically the multiple coefficients. This can be done for all multiple coefficients, but it has been done for the B modes because there lies the signal which you would find if you detect gravitational waves. And you have, if you have a a graviton with an effective mass of a certain range. And what I want to discuss is the range of this, of this graviton. Alright. <coughs> so very quickly, they immediately establish a relativistic and non-relativistic regime. As soon as we are in the relativistic regime here, we don't care about what happens, we're not going to see massive gravity because the mass doesn't matter. Right? So we're going to put ourselves in the other region. 
basically this is unimportant for us, and this is where we look for the inputs of the of the massive cluster. Now this, what I'm saying, needs to be this is for CMP, so it needs to be evolved from the combination up to now, and there is some assumption here because the standard background evolution should not deviate too much from uh, from the user box of the random CDM one, but you can see that even if you plug in different numbers over here, you can get more or less the same order of magnitude. So what I'm going to say it is true, absolutely up to a certain order, up to an order of magnitude. And what I'm saying here is, of course, for massive gravity. But at the end of this, I will come also on by that. Right? Because this, this analysis has been done for massive gravity again, but there is a nice regime in which everything should care for what's in the background. Anyway, we have a relativistic and relativistic regime. But things are not as easy. They are easy if the effective mass is actually smaller than H recombination. If that's the case, if I should have written smaller than H recombination and larger than <coughs> H recombination on this slide, but you'll see it's in another slide. <coughs> All I want to say here is that there is relativistic modes and the non-relativistic modes, and that sort of can be in this situation if the effective mass is smaller than H at recombination. Here's a Pictorial rule, what's going on? But why is this regime particularly nice? And this is this is what I like. So this regime is particularly nice because in this regime you get that d dot, which is proportional to the source, which we're going to feed in into the calculation of the multiple condition, is proportional to this to something like this times something else, right? But this is the important bit. Now, as you can see, if you go in the low L region, low multiple region, you are in a region in which Q is extremely small. So it is the M effective which is doing the job. M effective is actually enhancing <coughs> the gravitational wave signal in this low L region. Right? So if you have something that works like this, in so if you have the effective mass smaller than HR, you will most definitely have a regime in which if this guy has a specific body, this body you, know, you will you will have an enhancement. By how much of the of the people think that how much, well, this is a 0 0.01. So this is, let's say this is, it's, it's a log scale. But you can compare basically no um, alteration of the signal, usual signal versus strong signal. It's about two orders of magnitude. So you would actually seriously see something. <coughs> now, of course, this is the range. It's a very small range. It's just one order of magnitude sort of range. But there is still this range, and I guess we will celebrate that there's a range which you, you would eventually see the effect of uh, a massive gravity. And okay, you can translate in EV if you like EV. Now, if M is smaller than <coughs> this value, you're basically outside the visible universe, so you cannot see it, basically. So you're basically here. I mean, you, can't see, you will not be able to see anything. And if M is much, much larger than this sort of values, I mean, let's say M effective larger than 20 H recombination, your signal will be suppressed. Now, the problem is that there's this wonderful quick understanding of what's going on, qualitative understanding, in the case in which M effective is smaller than HR. And you just write down this one, and you convince yourself that this is true. It will be nice. <coughs> as soon as M effective is larger than HR combination, a lot of things can happen. And so things are not as clear cut as they were in the other case. So I've written it down here. Relativistic modes as they enter the horizon, which we come with stereotypistic, some that they are relativistic after combination, for example, or more relativistic as they enter, but they become non relativistic inside the horizon before the combination. So that means that this is the un completely uninteresting zone, because that's not going to give us any signal. Then there is this region number two, which is the one more or less responsible for the enhancement we talked about. And as you can see, if we are smaller than HR, that only exists this one and this one. So it's, it's, it's very clear cut what's going on. If you have region 3 and the higher the mass is, the more of region 3 you're going to have. What happens is that your mob enter the horizon and then they become non relativistic. If they are non relativistic, the frequency at which you are going to <coughs> oscillate is not going to be Q anymore, it's going to be M. The frequency is going to be then very, 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 very large, and therefore the signal is going to be suppressed. But this is going to happen asymptotically after you reach, you hit some M effective, which is, this is a Victorian view, which is of the order of 10 H, 20 H combination per large. What's hard to pin down is what's going on in this range. I mean, 
these people know that we have a, we have a product here, what's going to, I just don't have an immediate back of the envelope calculation to show you because they are competing effects. There is the effect coming from this region, which is enhancing the effect coming from this region, which is affecting. It's very hard to tell. To, it's very hard to tell what's going on in this region. You just put numbers through count, and this is how to result. So you get some concept for some value of the mass and some units, and some suppression. But as soon as you go larger from effective, that oscillating very fast fixed norm, and you will have a strong suppression of the same. So this is. You know, if you have a theory which works at to that scale, I think you should just plug in all this whole analysis which these guys did with it's, you know, it's very nice, I very much like it. Right, so how about by gravity? But then it's more complicated if you want to do this sort of stuff. And something which we sort of overlook because we have just one tensor, we have one massive tensor mod, not massive and massless next to each other, is the so psi, the source term. The one that we fill in into count to get us the um, uh, multiple coefficients is not proportional to this, proportional to this square. So if you have two tensor sector, one massless and one massive, then you're going to have cross terms, a lot of problems, you don't know who's been massive, who's been massless, who's been what, etc. But uh, yes. it's, it's kind of linear, it's, it's, it's a linear theory, right? So yes, but there's a combination, one is massless, the other is massive. Right? Sure, but it, it's a square, so you're going to have cross terms. And oh, I want to know yes. the, the exactly. exactly. And of course, there's another combination. If you're doing by gravity, you have the mass, sorry, the massless sector, the massive sector. But these guys are very not the same. Right? And we have the, the metric F, the metric G, and the question is who's being massive, who's being massless. And the answer is a time dependent answer. You don't, you don't know. You need to actually check. You need to do some Einstein. You need to check who's being massive, who's being massless. That's why I mentioned that model before, that paper by definition collaborators, because they have this theory which, in what they call the low energy limit, will give you a specific C, which doesn't depend on time, doesn't depend on anything, it's actually fixed. It depends on just alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha 4, etc. Et so just as an example of a possible application of these sort of results, even for by gravity, is you can find it in that paper. I mean, you can take that paper and try and go through all this reasoning, what you will find is that this relative coefficient at low energy for the model is actually fixed. And so we have a number here, and we have the M effective, this, sorry, you have a, a massive contribution to massless contribution. Now, as we have seen, in a certain range, the signal from this guy is actually 100 times bigger than what normally we have, which would be what this other contribution gives us. So if this relative coefficient is one tenth, or even 100 or larger, <coughs> you would in principle be able to observe the modification of the signal even for my graph. If, on the other hand, this guy is less than 10 to minus 2, then we should give up any hope to see a modification of the B-mod signal because this guy will be suppressed and nothing will happen in that, in that plot. And yeah, these are called the additive regime. So you need the mass to be in that relatively small range, and you need this guy to be larger than 10 to the minus 2. If you do, then you can use this result, which they have derived. Oh yes, and I should be precise, there's been a lot of work on, on massive and gravity in gravitational waves, and I only recently started to look at this thing, so I, I apologize. Just let me know if any of you work, and I should give citations to the proper people. Kind of complaints here. I have another email which I keep for me complaints. Just just let me know. Don't complain about the weather. Same comments there. It's fine. <laughs> and now another another distance in which we are going to end up by doing calculations in a society of gravity that an effective another <coughs> which we can constrain is not early time cosmology but late time cosmology late time constraints. So, how much should I put? Maybe I shouldn't ask this. Yeah, I shouldn't have asked. Sorry. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, so you have a point source, you have your Newtonian potential. As soon as you have a Galilean, so as soon as, okay, as soon as you have massive gravity, you take to the Catherine, which is going to illuminate what happens in the solar system, you will have this contribution as usual, plus this contribution and this other one. In spherically symmetric static solution, you basically end up with this variation on top of the usual Newtonian function. You can calculate some quantities like a fractional charge. <coughs> what we want to get at is that 
you can witness within the solar system additional projection of the period, for example, for the Earth Moon system. And if you plug in the numbers of, say, the Dr. <coughs> Galileo in Massigrafi, what you will get is a delta phi of the order 10 to the minus 16. And the current reach is actually 10 to the minus 11, which is not you know, five orders of magnitude. But if you do this, for example, for a cubic Galileo, you actually get 10 to the minus 12 over here. So this will put a constraint if we explicitly get what's in, in the Mersenian radius, a constraint on M, which we can play with because we have this experimental constraint in this file. And these constraints are actually getting better and better with time. The only thing I didn't tell you is that I was cheating because in order to get to a number, I need to specify what's going on. I need a uh, value for M, and in fact, let's say, I took it to be uh, H, H plug today, and that's how I got the number out. But if you, if you do things properly, you cannot do that because the mass that you need to, to, to play with is a mass that you extract from here. This alpha is actually equal to a combination, once again, of the massive interaction coefficients. And so what you're really probing is not m squared again, but you're probing m squared over alpha, which has been defined over there in the case of massive gravity. So once again, <coughs> doing these sort of things, you're putting constraints on another disguise of this effective mass. And if we do this all over and over again, we're going to you know, end up with, without, any, without any theory, because we're constraining everything. But since I'm optimistic about the theory, I'd like to talk about possible constraints. All right, so this was for uh, mass gravity. But since we were talking about flat gravity, we better do the gravity in the of pi gravity. Because that's, what, that's the tool to study the virus effect, which is, again, the tool to study what happens in the solar system. All right, so I, I should be quick here about the feedback formula. This is the, the best formula to derive the decapitalism of black gravity. A lot of work has been done on this. There are reasons to prefer the feedback formula, but you know, as long as you get wrong, anything we do. Um, I should say that, yeah, there is some slight difference with respect to what you do normally, but again, you always introduce the Zuckerberg's field to give you full views. The important point I want to make here is that however you do introduce the Zuckerberg's, even if you have other Zuckerberg's to introduce, we are choosing to put the Zuckerberg's on the F metric side, which is a choice. And all I'm going to talk about is related to the fact that this, putting the Zuckerberg's field to, to restore full views on the F metric side, remember this is the F metric side, is a choice. This is a choice, and this choice has profound, the fact that this is just a choice has profound implications of this. Mateo, yes. why the Lorentz transformation? Why? Yeah, why the lambda AB? Oh, I think that just there. You mean this stuff? No, no, up, uh, it was in F, when you Schuckelberg out, the, it was F tilde A mu is. Yeah, because it's a local Lorentz transformation, so you need to. Uh, in, in the field. Okay. So we, yeah. we, we can write down. Yeah. So you have Okay. You, you can integrate them out. I don't need it in the metric language, but you need to do it in the language. But if, if you're more comfortable, you just integrate them out and, and be here. Yeah. Okay. So for massive gravity, we know that the, the massive curves breaks. Diffs and gives you the valence for by gravity, something like this is going to happen. This will be sufficient symmetry left to actually change who you are going to superiorize, either F or G. And this is the very important thing. So again, I restate this because it's going to be important. But what we do, what is it that we do normally? Dynamical metric G, dynamical metric F, sticking the Stuckerbergs here, and as usual the Stuckerbergs are defined this way where I'm Pretending I forget about the vectors because I'm not going to be real about it here. <coughs> but this is what we do, right? This is exactly what you would do the first day that you're asked to write down the decapanemic of my Then you take the limit, and in doing so, you have to be a little careful here because you have to take the limit in such a way that all the degrees of freedom that you have preserved. Otherwise, you're not doing a good decapanemic. Uh, yeah, otherwise, the decapanemic is 40. It's not, it's a scaling unit, so you, you must preserve the number of the piece of freedom. This is what we're after. This is a bit of what we, what we obtain. And when you write down things the way you used to, the metric, you end up with this result. So you will immediately spot this bit and this bit, which are the usual guys from a signal. These, as you would expect, with B mu are the things <coughs> on the left side. And this a little bit earlier bit coming from mixing 
the tensors on the F side with your right? Yes. Okay. So how are we going to make sense of this term, which is actually, what I'm writing here, what this means is dependent of. So these V, the tensors, are not H V mu of X as they are here. They are V mu of some weird X tilde, which has a Galilean in it. It's a, it's a, it's a strange, strange dependence. And if you are after a nicer dependence, a much nicer dependence, then you can actually find a way out to write things down nicely. In fact, I have them here written down as V mu of X times this y key that just like the usual Galilean mixing would look like, but I can do this just by change of variable, which is completely allowed because there's a dummy index in the integral, things will look like this way. And then you might ask, who is this z or zeta function which is allowing me to do this? And <coughs> by making it look nice, just as nice as the usual Galilean from a And this function z is defined in the following way. This is an intrinsic way it's defined, but this is the definition of z. And if you remind yourself the way we uh, introduced phi, we immediately see that actually zeta is phi to the minus one. So this zeta, which is giving you the Galileo in the nice, clean way, is actually the inverse function of phi. Stuff that gave you the Galileans to start with. So you can you immediately realize that you can write things down this way. You can write things down as zeta doing exactly what phi was doing before, and this is mapped to the fact I see a zero effect. <laughs> yeah, I'm carry on a bit more. And then you can just beat me with a stick. <laughs> but I have, I have just have five slides. So I have this thing, so don't promise. <laughs> All right, so just five minutes, I promise. So you see that there is this uh, gravity duality at work, because as we said in Black or Mark, right, we have this complete identification here. And then if Suppose I, you were doing, you were doing <coughs> the company of the graph, and you were calling G, G, and F, F, and I came, fake your handwriting, and called F, G. You would, you would not notice the difference. You would then put the Stuckerberg on the, um, the G side. You would have proceeded on, on deriving the, the, the company of, of my gravity, and you would end up exactly with this. You would have called this guy high and this guy X. The only difference is that you, are, you would have put the Stuckerbergs on the geometric side, which you can do. So you can either go this way or this way. And the relation between this field pi and this field rho is going to be given to you by again, this function zeta, which is the inverse function of phi. And in fact, there is this relation between these two Galileans, the Galileans on one side and the other side, which we call, we call this guy the Galilean, this guy the dual Galilean, and we can show you very quickly how you map from one theory to the other with this duality toolbox, which has been derived completely by using the properties of that function zeta and nothing else. So just to be quick, I give you one Galilean on one side, the other the dual Galilean action. This is just one way to write down the real actions. And just keep in mind this little duality toolbox. A toolbox with just three things that you can do. So it's not a big toolbox. Right? So you have this Galilean action over here. You vary the action like this. You write it down like this, and then you use the toolbox to substitute x with x theta, and yes, and pi of x for pi of x with pi of x, you use this other equation. You can do it. On the other side, you're ready with this other dual Galilean action, and just by comparing what you get here and here, you realize that these two theories are exactly the same theory upon using this picture. So this is the difference that you use in terms of coefficients. So you're basically mapping a Galilean with a CN coefficient, a group of CN coefficients, <laughs> to another Galilean with another group of PN coefficients. But that's all they're doing. I mean, these are very small hypotheses, and this is very few hypotheses, and this is what you're getting. You're using the toolbox. You're starting with one Galilean on one side, the dual Galilean on the other side, and you get some identification of the two. And just to be too very quick example of what this can do, for you, you get, of course, the first, the most tempting thing to do as soon as you realize that there is a map is take a free theory on one side and see what happens on the other side, right? So you take the free theory because you know everything about it, it is causal, it is even trivial, off-shell, on-shell, it's fine. You know everything about the free theory, that, that's what you love about it. And you try to map it to something else. And you find that yeah, it's actually mapped to something that looks a bit more complicated, it's actually a quintic Galilean. And if you 
want to, to carry on, if for example I can I look for a solution for this, maybe you, you, you don't want sources, just don't put sources in there, simplify things at the box, put down an equation of motion and find out the wave solution. You can find it, it, it will look like this, and if you calculate the speed of fluctuations around this solution, you will see that one is for this <coughs> as a as a last speed of light, and the other one depends on what you're doing with the locking. What you will find out that even within the regime of the theory that you're using, f double prime can actually be smaller than zero, and this guy can be superluminous. So you can have superluminosities on this side, and everything is just heaven from the other side. Now, what you will immediately is worry, superluminosity, or the fourth superluminous, so it's causal, so let's just try it. Which you could do, but then there's one thing to, to keep in mind it's that what this is, and actually in this case they coincide, is is not the front velocity, or mine's front. That's just that. It's not the front velocity. It's actually the slope velocity. Actually, in this case, they coincide. The group velocity and the phase velocity are the same. But what should worry you when you're talking about causality is actually the front velocity. The front velocity is the final asymptotic. You have to take C as dependent on K for K that goes very large. Now, on this side, Whatever you do, you know what's going on. On this other side, this is a three level statement. And so if you want to check what's really going on in terms of causality, you need a full calculation. So this, it, it's very provoking. I like it very much, but the point is that if you cut the duality, you know that if you include loops and everything, causality will be fine over here. You shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about what the phase velocity or the group velocity are doing. This is what the, the duality is telling you. And yeah, and I like this picture. Oh, and another another thing for which and this is, not, is this the last slide? Yes. <laughs> it's next to the last slide. Another thing I want to say is that this duality can actually be used if you want to study the Meister mechanism. So let's suppose that you have Galilean pi, <coughs> and let's suppose that you find a solution and you look at the asymptotic solution, right? So the solution is no problem. It is an asymptotic solution. Why, why should I care about it? Well, I care about it if I'm able to mark it to a solution for the dual Galilean, where this dual Galilean is being screened. To a, if I'm able to mark an asymptotic region to a so-called Weinstein region. And as it turns out, at least in this example, which is actually a 3D example, so it's a static Galilean in 4D, you can actually mark a stupid looking um, asymptotic solution for pi to a region for raw, which is a Weinstein region, so where the screening is very active. And I'm not sure I'm going to do, but it's, you can do also the, the opposite, of course, because the map is supposed to work. So what I'm saying is that this is another circumstance in which this duality can work. But to go back to my initial point, the way this duality emerged was actually in the context of the limit, the, the couple limit of by gravity. And the original reason that I told you why this the is useful for the purposes of this funny picture is because it is in the category of the gravity that we can do solar system as for bi gravity and what it's all the problem is that when we explicitly this kind of find diagonalize the elicity to zero uh, interactions, we diagonalize them, we get Galilean interactions and those Galilean interactions are going to be the ones that give us some other effective mass, an effective mass which will be of this type. Only this has been derived from massive right, and we've been derived something very similar, maybe more complicated actually, for my gravity, function of another branch of alpha, and be some other combination of alpha 1, two, three, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, etc. And that will allow us to place another bound on the effective mass of the gravity and from another completely really different sort of physics, this is late time physics, and to conclude, I think, but at least for me, since I started doing this sort of stuff, it's a bit of a roller coaster of emotions. You're very sad one day and very happy the other day, and no one will support because as soon as you find something, some stability criteria is being satisfied, someone tells you oh, there's a gravity, there's a uh, instability, and so on and so forth. But since I'm optimistic, I'm just not worried about finding the perfect, viable, stable solution today, because I think that's going to come up. At some point, what I would worry about is that once we have that, 
we have already worked out all the possible constraints that you can get from a lot of different physics to place on this M effective. Because I think, you know, because I'm optimistic, I think that theory will be found. I just want to be ready to give all the constraints and, and see what's going on. Yes.